Andy, what, what got you personally interested in whiskey in the first time? Oh, my, mine is a mine's an interesting story. It's definitely not. Uh, uh, I didn't ever envisage myself being in the liquor industry. I was a professional sportsman. I I played cricket. I went to school. Like most kids in the 60s, uh, I dreamt of being a professional footballer. England had just won the World Cup in 1966, so you know my sole focus of school was playing sport. And I stayed on at school to do what was then the A-levels, just so I could play a little bit more sport. And I didn't make it as a professional footballer, but I got the opportunity to play professional cricket. Um, which outside of England in Europe is not really a, a popular popular sport. But uh, that brought me to South Africa um, to escape the cold English-European winters. Um, I arranged to, to come to South Africa and I came to this town called Wellington where we are today. And one of the, the parts of the deal was that I had to work part-time because they couldn't afford the, the, the whole salary which I wanted, the cricket club. And they got me working with a company called Moniz in Paul, which was part of the Stellenbosch Farmers Winery Liquor Group. And so I would work for the mornings there, plan my, really plan my coaching for the afternoon at the schools. And then I would travel back to uh, UK for the summers again. And I did that for three years, but each one of the three years when I was working part time, I I started to, to take a bit more notice of what I was doing. And uh, when I got released from my contract in the UK, uh, I still had six months to run in, Sa in South Africa. So when I came back, I actually made the decision to, to stay permanently in South Africa and Stellenbosch Farmers Winery or um, Moniz then gave me a full-time contract. And about a year later, we were doing bulk business uh, with Morrison Bulmore in, in Scotland, Morrison Bulmore Distillers, uh, buying bulk whiskey from them to go into the three ships uh, blend. And every year, their directors would come to South Africa and they would have discussions. And this particular year, 1985, I was actually asked if I'd like to attend, you know, the function. And to be honest, I thought it was because. I was really the only one who spoke English and could understand the Scotch and that was the reason why they wanted me to be at this function. And as the night went on and the wine flowed and you know, typical South African hospitality, uh, I got more talking more and more to these people and uh, you know, at the end of the evening Brian Morrison and Alistair Ross uh, suggested that why don't I come to Scotland and learn how to make whiskey and I said well if you can convince the company to allow me to do that you know I'd love to and uh, yeah the next morning I was called into the office and said listen we would like to send you to Scotland for a few months to, to learn a little bit about uh, whiskey and I said great and over the next four years I went each year for several months and yeah that's how I was introduced to, to whiskey and I think whilst I was in Scotland working with you know, people like Stuart Hawkinson at uh, Ockentoshan and Willie McNeil at uh, Glengarry. And then the third of Morrison's distilleries, the iconic uh, Beaumont on the island of Isla, which at that stage Jim McEwen was the manager of. So I worked with Jim there as well. And, you know, I think the passion which those guys had for what they did and, and even down to the chief chemist production director, which was David Gressick and you know, a lot of the backroom lower staff, uh, they just ooze this passion for what they were doing. And it's something I think I brought back with me. And I, I just, you know, when I, the trips ended in 1989 when, when Brian sold uh, the business to Suntory. Um, and that was when I came back and, and then, you know, got to close down uh, R&B in Stellenbosch and then move across here to Wellington and, and on let's say a larger scale start making uh, whiskey for the company. Um, you know, and all I did was I tried to bring back some of that passion and, and just kind of say in the back of my head that, you know, although the Scots are, are probably, you know, the most famous for making whiskey, they, they don't have the sole prerogative to do it. And, and so I set about, along with a, an amazing team which I built up over a period of time, you know, we set about kind of 
trying to change the image of what South African whiskey was, that we were making world-class wine. We still make world-class wine, brandy. Um, we've got you know, amazing engineers throughout the world, uh, actors. So why can't we make world-class whiskey? And, and that was kind of you know, how it all started. So if you just said to me when I was in my last year at school, listen, in 10 years time, you're going to be making whiskey, I would have thought you were you know, smoking something. I wouldn't have, wouldn't have even crossed my mind. And now it's, I'm into my 35th year in the industry and uh, you know, the last 28 of them have been dedicated to, to improving and, and trying to put South African whiskey firmly on the world whiskey map. What about the equipment? Well, you know, when we started, uh, to be honest, it was really, you know, it was it was it was not good equipment. A lot of it was homemade. Um, over the last 15 to 20 years, uh, the company has invested heavily. Uh, I couldn't have wished to add better backing from any company I could have worked for. I mean, they uh, really. You know, we sat and we discussed things, and 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 the company supported. So, Distel, who's our holding company, have uh, have been phenomenal. Even when whiskey wasn't the most popular uh, uh, spirit drink in South Africa, they still come. Uh, you know, continue to invest behind uh, our dream here at Wellington, and also, you know, what it could mean to the company one day. So, you'll see when we take a walk around that. Uh, things look maybe a little bit different than they do in Scotland. Um, you know, I have personally uh, the utmost respect for for Scotland and all of their traditions, uh, which stretch back way over 500 years. Um, but you know, in our industry, which is 42 years old, um, you know, we're not held back by tradition. Uh, so if we're innovative in the way we do things within the legislation then you know nobody kind of looks at you and says you know why are you doing that because we're still busy making our own footprints in the sand and placing our fingerprints down and while we're doing that you know you'll find there's a lot more stainless steel here um, you know we don't have wooden washbacks we have stainless steel our climate in South Africa has meant that we also have to do things uh, slightly differently to make sure that you know we can have consistent quality in our in our wash, etc. Uh, so yeah, it's uh, a lot of the things you'll recognise, but a lot of the things you'll you know you'll see are probably quite different.